Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Jonathan Farrow, along with Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. Join us each day for insight from the best in markets, economics and geopolitics. From our global headquarters in New York City, we are live on Bloomberg Television weekday mornings from 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business app. We begin with our top story. Stocks on pause with all eyes on Jackson Hole. Traders looking for rate cut clues from Fed Chair Jay Powell when he speaks tomorrow. Mohamed Al Erin of Queen's College Cambridge saying the stakes are high, writing in a Bloomberg opinion piece, quote, it is critical for Powell to take advantage of the golden opportunity he has this Friday to regain control of the economic and policy narrative. Mohammed joins us now for more. Mohammed, good morning. It's good to see you. Good morning, John. Thanks You're for having me. You'll be for the next 90 minutes, so we've got plenty of time to work through these issues. I went through the piece on Bloomberg Opinion, pretty extensive, and a long list of asks for Chairman Powell tomorrow. I'm going to go through another quote that you wrote. It is particularly critical that people come away from Wyoming with a clearer picture of the new equilibrium policy rate that neither restrains nor fuels economic activity. The path to that rate and a, what a sustainable 2% inflation target means in practice. Now, that's what you want. Are you expecting to get it this week? I hope I'll get one of those three, if not two. John, it's critical because as you and Danny have been discussing this morning, it's not just about price volatility, it's been narrative volatility. People have moved violently in terms of the narrative of the economy, in terms of what the Fed should do on the basis of high frequency, noisy data. And that tells you that we're lacking anchors in this economy. We're lacking a robust growth anchor. We're lacking lacking a robust policy forward guidance. And we're lacking a robust technical anchor. So we should hope for the Fed to start restoring the policy anchor. The way you do that is you tell people where you see the destination and how you think you're going to get there. That's what I think he should do. Whether he does or not, I'm not sure. Well, let's talk about what complicates it. The second anchor, forward guidance. You yourself, this is your language in your piece, you call it an ocean of genuine uncertainty. How do you provide forward guidance in an ocean of genuine uncertainty? The same way we do everything in life is that you say, this is where I think it is right now. This is where I think our star is, as opposed to saying, I'm I'm not going to talk about it. This is where I think it is. It is dependent on these variables. And I will modify it if a mid-course correction is needed. Do you think it's important that they discuss how they view the size of cuts, how they view 25 versus 50 basis points? I think it is important, but it's second order importance. So the first one is, what does the destination look like? And secondly, how are we going to get there? It is problematic in my mind that the market is pricing in so many rate cuts right now. And Danny, you said it right this morning, is that there's there's this contrast between what the bond market thinks and what the equity market thinks. And this notion, and I love the way both of you have framed it, of a hard landing policy response to achieve a soft landing, that has got to be reconciled one way or the other. So I think the the market is overdoing it. I don't think we're going to get 200 basis points of cuts in 12 months. I don't think we're going to get 100 basis points of cuts this year. I think we're going to get 75 and 150 in total. Mm -hmm. But the market's going to have to adjust at some point. Well, a few people looked at the minutes that were released yesterday and said the fact that several of them discussed cutting in July maybe is them implicitly realizing that they are behind and that they need to be more. Did you come away with that from the same with the same idea? So when I read the notion that several, several, not some, several thought that a July cut was plausible, and I thought to myself, what about the press conference? What happened in the press conference? Why didn't we hear that? And then when I heard both of you discuss the fact that a lot of people are discussing is are the minutes massaged in some way after the meeting to reflect what has happened since? We won't know until we get the transcripts. Okay, but, but it is interesting that they put that in the minutes. Well, there's two options. Either the Fed chair does a lousy job of reflecting consensus in the news conference or they massage the minutes. You're quite critical, more critical than me, of this Federal Reserve. Poor forecasting, confusing communication, and lapses in bank regulation as well across those three things. And you think that maybe this could have some really large consequences. There's a quote in this piece that jumped off the page to me, Mohammed. The Fed could further risk damaging its policy effectiveness and reputation, and countries around the world would look for more ways to de-risk both their economies and their financial systems from a Fed that no longer responsibly anchors what is still a dollar-dominated international monetary 
system. Now, that's not something you just write lighthearted. That's not just you sort of writing that down and expecting us to ignore it. That's important. Do you think that's what's at risk here? I do, and I really worry about it, John. Um, the US, at the core of the system, has been able to inform and influence outcomes all over the world. And it has been able to lead policy coordination where needed. Why? Because the US was seen to, seen to be a, a responsible steward of the global economy. That started to be undermined in 2008. It was undermined even more in 2017. It's been undermined even more in 2021, 22 with the transitory inflation mistake. And what we're seeing is our people starting to hedge away from the dollar. Look at the price of gold, record after record after record. Look at central bank buying of gold around the world. They're diversifying away from the dollar. So I do worry that unless we regain policy credibility, that you're going to start seeing the system fragment, not just for geopolitical reasons, which we know is fragmenting, yeah. but fragmenting because there's less trust in the way the system is managed. Well, that's what I actually wanted to ask you. You went there exactly where I wanted to go. Is that driven by one half of DC or the other, or both? And how much of it is driven by one and maybe not the other? Because in my mind and other people's minds, they might be listening to this and saying, well, that's about sanctions. That's coming from the government. That's coming from outside of the world of monetary policy. How much of it is about that versus, say, the things we're talking about right now? We have never seen the amount of volatility in the two-year that we have seen recently. The two years is supposed to be anchored by the Fed forward policy guidance. The longer end can do all sorts of things, but at least you know the two year, which, which the two to five year, lots and lots of stuff gets priced off that internationally. And it has been a roller coaster. So geopolitics has a big influence, but what we have to minimize is giving another reason for people to diversify away from the system. Because they're, they're diversifying not to another system, they're diversifying to fragmentation. They're diversifying to a system that builds little pipes around the center and doesn't solve as well as it should otherwise. And the world will suffer as a result. The things you're talking about, they are structural changes that central banks are undergoing. And, and I just wonder if Powell is able to wrestle back control, if government concern doesn't erode it further, can it be undone? Or is this point we're at, has the damage already been done and, and, the, and you basically can't put the pace back in the tube? So I think the economic side can be undone. You can go back. You can put the pace back into the tube, as you said it. Um, it's a matter of being somewhat less backward looking and having the courage to be strategic as well. We are excessively data dependent. In fact, the Fed being excessively data dependent has led the analyst community to be excessive data dependent. Look at how probabilities of recession have moved on high frequency noisy data. That shouldn't happen. You said earlier, jobless claims has suddenly become this incredible number. Anybody who has been following that series for a long time knows it's incredibly noisy. And yet, it can turn markets and it can turn narratives. Are you confident the Fed will change, though? I mean, the language that we've heard, it still is one of data dependence. It still is one of looking for the next payrolls print to try to get an idea of where they should go. How much confidence do you have that they'll actually adopt what you're recommending? And the word confidence is so important because it's in every Fed narrative, the word confidence. My confidence is growing. I mean, they, they, they are now willing to shift their focus on both elements of their mandate. They're, I think, a little bit worried that the market has forgotten about the inflation part of the mandate. And the market's only worried about the employment part. So I think they're a little bit worried about that. But they're willing to shift the demand. I think they're going to get that. I think they're getting more confidence now that inflation is below 3% on the CPI. And I know that that's not what they look at, but that's what everybody else looks at. Um, so I think they're gaining more, more confidence. So, so I am, too, gaining confidence that they're going to be able to get out of this phase of excessive data dependence that was caused by the big policy mistake in 2021. Victoria Fernandez of Crossmark Global Investments joins us. Victoria, last time we caught up, you were worried about a slowdown in the second half. Are you seeing evidence of that or evidence to the contrary? No, I think we're still looking at signs that are telling us a slowdown could be coming. I know that the idea of a recession has really uh, been taken off the table for most people, but I think a slowdown in the economy is there. I mean, look, you've got small caps outperforming large yesterday, but yet 
40 percent of the Russell 2000 hasn't even had a profit. They haven't reported a profit over the last 12 months. You've got the difference between the two year and the Fed funds at extreme levels, typically that you only see um, when you're in a recession. You have saving rates coming down while delinquencies are going up. Um, we know the consumer, even though they're spending, are being very cautious in what they're spending. And, and I think when we look at the labor market and wages and earnings and margins for corporations, we could see that start to tighten up a little bit. And I think a good sign, you were just talking about the housing market, mortgage rates are down 80 basis points, and we aren't even seeing a bump in the housing market. We've seen refis go up applications, but not home buyers. So I still think there's some struggling going on in this economy, and I think we'll continue to see it in the second half of the year. Enough of a struggle to validate what's been priced into Federal Reserve rate cut expectations. Look, the Fed, in my opinion, is going to go very slowly. So your last guest talked about two rate cuts this year. That's where we at Crossmark are as well. 25 in September, 25 in December. I don't think they're going to go more than that, which means we may see a little bit of a repricing in the bond market. Two years, you were just mentioning, are right back up a close to 4%. We could see yields start to go back up as some of that is priced out of the market. Some of the cuts people are expecting. I mean, what are they pricing in now? Three and a half, four cuts. It's similar to what we saw at the beginning of the year when everyone was expecting five or six, they had to come back and reprice the market. So in our fixed income portfolios, we've gone close to neutral duration. We're not ready to go long yet at this point. Victoria, is a Fed that goes slow with data that's getting weaker but not necessarily weak. Is that also consistent with gold priced at $2,500 an ounce? You know, it's very interesting, Dana, because you're seeing this differentiation coming now between gold and Bitcoin, where they had been going together for quite a long period of time. So I think people are going to gold. You're seeing the dollar come down. I know it had a little bit of a bounce yesterday, but the dollar's down pretty significantly. If the Fed is starting to lower rates, we'll see that happen more. So people going into gold for a safe haven play. And we're seeing a lot of gold buying coming out of Asia as well. So not surprised gold is moving higher. Not surprised we're seeing the dollar come down. I think that fits with the story of a Fed slowly removing um, some of the tightness that's there. I think one of the things I like to say is the Fed is not really being accommodative um, over the next few months. I think they're just going to be less restrictive. I just wonder what you think the success is in doing that, is using gold as a hedge. David Rosenberg at Rosenberg Research thinks he's going to go to, it's going to go to 3,000 simply because people don't trust bonds as a hedge right now. They don't trust central bank policy. They don't trust the guidance. So gold is where you hide out. Victoria, gold hasn't had the best track record of being the place that you can hold out over long periods of time. So is it now the time? Can now be the time that you, do, can, you can hold on to gold as something that protects you instead of something like bonds? So it hurts my heart a little bit, Danny, when you say people don't like bonds, because I do manage taxable fixed income here at Crossmark. Um, so I think you need to have some allocation to bonds in your portfolio. Look, it's a cash flow component, right? So maybe it's not a safe haven in the sense that from the time of purchase to the time of maturity, you don't have market value volatility, you will, but you get a steady cash flow coming from that. Is it okay to have a little bit of gold as a hedge in your portfolio? I think that's fine. Do you do a huge allocation shift to that, I think that's a little much. I don't think there's anything in the economy that's telling us we have to make that drastic of a move. There is one thing that you've been saying, though, that runs contrary to what we've heard from a lot of people in fixed income. And I understand they've got something to sell, so there is sort of a bias in all of this, too. You're still saying that just sit there and earn cash, earn money on cash, sit there at the front end, take your 5%. Victoria, other people, as you know, are coming on the program and saying you've got to lock in what's available at the long end right now because that's not going to be there in several months' time. Why is your approach a little bit different? Well, I think they need to look at it from a barbell approach, Jonathan. I mean, look, yes, you can get some of that um, locked in on the short end. We know the Fed's going to lower rates. We talked about the difference between the two-year and the Fed funds being quite extreme. That's going to have to narrow at some point. So do the short end of the curve, do those yields come down? Yes. So you get in now, you get a little bit of price appreciation in that because you will have lower yields going forward. So lock some of that in. But I agree, go out a little bit on the curve, add some of that on 
on the longer end, if you can still get four, four and a half, five percent in quality investment grade, we're talking A, double A rated, not even having to go into triple B rated um, bonds, go ahead and put that in there as well. Again, it's part of that cash flow story and sets you up, especially if you're trying to match liabilities with the assets in your portfolio, it puts you in a good place over the next five to seven years. Victoria, I've also got to ask you, because I know you see wages and how it relates to consumption as one of the can can canaries in the coal mine for this economy. Given that, what, what did you make of some of these retail earnings we've gotten, the success of a target and the lack of it for someone like Macy's? It's an interesting um, kind of bifurcation that we're seeing. Obviously, Walmart did really well. I think some of the reason you're seeing a name like Walmart do well is because they have captured a much larger audience than they used to have. We know that a lot of high-income spenders have actually moved into Walmart, so they're gaining traction there. Target was interesting. We know that their comps, they have pretty easy comps because they have been underperforming for quite a long period of time. Glad to see them coming back. You're seeing better pricing in some of those elements. I know they said clothing was up, so that's good. And they also had a big boost from e-commerce. So again, different elements that are helping support. But Macy's, Macy's been struggling for a while. They are that middle income consumer that is really having to pull back on discretionary spending as some of their more um, non-discretionary items like food continue to move higher. So definitely a bifurcation that we're seeing in retail some of your low-cost providers um, are gaining share and doing better while that middle-income consumer store is really starting to struggle. It does come down to wages. Wages is the driver of consumption. And I think as we see margins start to compress and earnings start to come down a little bit in the next six months or so, we can see wages start to stagnate. That's going to hurt the consumer. When did you last go to a Macy's, Victoria? How long ago was it? <laughs> It's been a while. I will say I've been to Bloomingdale's across the street from you guys, but Macy's, it has been quite a few years since I have stepped foot in a Macy's, and it's probably why they're closing a lot of their stores right now. Yeah, Bloomingdale's so close, you can accidentally fall into it, walking down yeah. Lexington Avenue. I, I get it. <laughs> I get it. It's convenient. Victoria, thank you. Victoria Fernandez across Crossmark Global Investments. I feel the same. It's local. over at the DNC in Chicago, the main event coming this evening with a keynote address from the Vice President Kamala Harris. At the DNC is Anne-Marie. AMH, good morning. Good morning, John. And ahead of that keynote address from Kamala Harris, where we know the economy has been the top issue of this election, I'm now joined by the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, senior senator from Oregon, Senator Ron Wyden. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. So, so your colleague, uh, Senator Mark Warner, called next year 2025 tax Armageddon. And you've been working already on tax issues. Where do you see room for compromise in 2025? Well, for, first of all, we showed in 2024 we wanted a bipartisan approach. You know, I put together a bill that had child tax credit and hundreds of thousands of units of housing and help for small business. And senior Republicans just didn't want to do it. I mean, the fact was J.D. Vance wouldn't even show up for work. So we had a bill that was fully paid for, according to the Joint Committee on Taxation, would have been a big shot in the arm for families. 16 million kids would have been helped, 4 million small businesses, and Republicans were just AWOL. Well, J.D. Vance was campaigning at the time, and even many Democrats would say this was a show vote. They knew they didn't have the votes yet. Republicans want to wait to 2025. So that is why I think he, he would say he didn't well, show up for I that I understand vote. that if he had been there, if he'd shown up, we could have gotten this passed. It would have gone to the president. It would have been a huge shot in the arm to the economy. You know, we're talking about interest rates now. Looks like the Fed is going to lower uh, interest rates. This is something that would really help families because you got to understand that working families, when they get these kind of kind of breaks, they go out and buy food and clothing and the like. What do the Republicans want to do? They want class war on working people. They want to hit them with tariffs and tariffs or taxes on them. Okay, so let's talk about what could potentially be. Uh, renegotiated for next year. We know Republicans will sign on for an expansion of child tax, child tax credits. J.D. Vance, Trump, uh, believe in that. Well, let, but what about the corporate tax let's, rate? Let's, Kamala Harris says 28%. Let, Do you think that's the opening salvo? Let's remember that the Republicans consistently in campaigns talk about things that they are going to say they're interested in for working people, and then they go out and write these bills that are trickle-down economics and give most of the breaks to the well-to-do. 
Now, let's talk about where we are on things like corporate taxes. I want to make sure that we have a reasonable rate that's going to allow us to compete in tough global markets. We know this is a challenging you know, economy. This 21%, Donald Trump pulled out of nowhere. Nobody had any discussion about that in the Senate Finance Committee. And I can tell you, a lot of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, including some Republicans, they don't think the 21% uh, fits or definition of a reasonable rate. So what do you think is reasonable? I think that uh, Western civilization isn't going to end with uh, Kamala uh, Harris's uh, proposals. We're going to work uh, in the committee uh, to get a reasonable rate and one that will keep our com companies competitive. Okay, so that sounds to me maybe like 25%, which I've been hearing as something maybe there could be a negotiation around 25%. There was, there, were, there was a lot of interest in 25% rate tied to increased opportunities to do business in the United States. Look at the big pharmaceutical companies. They generate a lot of their sales uh, in the United States, you know, a lot of uh, senior citizens, and then they go overseas to get a, a, a cheap tax break. Let's talk about American business. Part of Kamala Harris's economic plan has been, been this idea about price gouging, going after these individuals in the, in the corporate world that are hiking up prices. And many are viewing that as potentially, is this going to usher in price controls? What is your take on this issue? And can you name a company that is currently price gouging? I'm, I'm glad you asked about uh, this, because I think uh, the vice president is moving in the right direction. We believe in markets. I'm the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. I believe in markets. I believe in marketplace uh, uh, forces. That's always the best way to go. But when markets are breaking down, you need some guardrails. And that is what the vice president you know, is talking about. Now, I'm going to be going home. I'm going to be flying all night to have town hall meetings in, uh, in rural Oregon. You know what folks are going to ask me about? They're going to ask me about the biggest grocery merger in American history, you know, Kroger's and Albertsons. Do you think it should go through? Well, what I've said is I think we ought to kind of take a time out. I've been part of the effort uh, uh, with uh, Congresswoman uh, Jayapal to say let's uh, have uh, kind of a recall on this decision for a while and think through how to come up with a fair uh, agreement. But what I can tell you is when you know milk is $4, $4 a gallon in a lot of places, meat $10 a pound, a lot of people are saying, get us a fair shake. And the concentration and consolidation we've seen in, seen in these uh, food markets, I think is uh, what we got to deal with. But prices have come, to, come, come down. Walgreens, Target, all these places, Walmart, slashing their prices. They see higher end consumers actually trading down to some of their softer prices. And that was welcomed by the White House. Isn't this all caused by inflation, not corporate greed? Well, certainly we're, we're coming out of COVID. There are a bunch of factors. But what I can tell you, in my state, we're losing choices, for example, even for buying medicine. You know, we have only a couple of, uh, of big pharmacies now. They consolidate, and uh, that's anti-consumer. I'm a markets-oriented Democrat. I want to come back to that. But I think when markets aren't going very well, we need to have some guardrails and make sure we protect the consumer. Senator Ron Wyden, thank you so much for your time for joining Bloomberg TV. Jonathan, of course, he's also the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. He will be key to next year's 2025 tax fight. I had no idea the people of Oregon were that interested in antitrust and competitive issues. Amory, thank you. AMH over in Chicago. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in markets, economics and geopolitics. You can watch the show live on Bloomberg TV weekday mornings from 6am to 9am Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And as always on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business App.